Hello, this is Kate Crowley, Professor of Practice from Teachers College, Columbia University in New York City. Welcome to Module 1 in our evaluation series, Disorder, Difference, or Gap, a School-Age Disability Evaluation. This module series is intended to give evaluators a step-by-step -step approach on how to assess and evaluate a school-age student based on current law, ASHA guidelines, and evidence-based practice. I'm going to use an evaluation of a 13-year-old girl. We'll call her Sophie. Sophie is a very interesting case. She came from a difficult background and due to changes in her family structure, she attended five different schools before she had finished the fifth grade. From birth through fourth grade, she was exposed to Puerto Rican Spanish, African American English, Spanish influenced English, and code switching, but with minimal exposure to standard American English. Two and a half years before this evaluation, Sophie was adopted by a family who uses only standard American English in the home. And for the past two years, she has been in a school where her peers and teachers only speak standard American English as well. Sophie definitely has academic gaps, and she also has language and dialect differences. But as evaluators, we need to distinguish a true disorder from a language difference and from academic gaps resulting from a lack of adequate educational instruction. In this module series, we will walk through a full evaluation of Sophie, including the gathering of evidence from the parent and teacher interviews, portfolio review of her work, observations of her current school, analysis of her prior disability evaluations, and of course, our clinical interactions with Sophie. As we gather this data, what I call assessment, we evaluate this data and make inferences and hypotheses about what we are learning. This often leads us to gather additional data to bolster or weaken these inferences and hypotheses about her language skills. We are always asking the questions, am I seeing a disorder, a difference, or academic gaps? I have written the full evaluation of Sophie that you can download at leadersproject.org. I will be referring to parts of that evaluation during this module series. Additionally, at the end of that evaluation, I include my recommendations. So please pause the video now and download it. This module series includes module one with this introduction and information on Sophie's language and dialect acquisitional history, family history, and educational background. In Module 2, we look at Sophie's academic achievement through an extensive teacher interview and observations of her schoolwork, including information from Sophie and her mother. Module 3 is the direct clinical evaluation with Sophie and includes my analysis of what we learned from the different language probes. Module 4 is the heart of the evaluation. Our analysis that comes after gathering all this data to determine whether Sophie has a language disorder, a language difference, or simply academic gaps that need to be filled, or of course, some combination of all three. At the beginning of every evaluation, I speak to the parent. We begin with part of the interview I did with Sophie's adoptive mom. I ask her to describe concerns regarding Sophie's language skills. Celeste, can you tell me a little bit about your concerns with Sophia's speech and language? So we're worried about um, how long it takes her to answer things, so production of oral language, and also it seems processing, mm -hmm. and also I feel like the patterns of um, verb tenses that she conjugates I know are not uh, standard English, but they also don't seem to be regular, they don't seem to follow a pattern. And then I, she also has, you know, major vocabulary um, mis confusions, and also she'll come up with a word to identify something, and it's the wrong word, um, and it seems like it takes her a long time to learn the correct word. Like here's an example: the very first time when I was started to be worried about like what's happening um, was um, when the snowplow came down the road, and she's like, "Oh, the snow pusher thing." And then I said, oh, snowplow. Oh, the snowplow's coming, the snowplow's coming. But she didn't start calling it the snowplow. Mm -hmm. She kept calling it the snow pusher thing. Mm -hmm. And then, and true too for like conjugating verbs. 
um, they don't seem to follow a pattern. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. The mother is very clear about her concerns, most of which center around vocabulary development, processing, and verb tenses. In this case, Sophie's adoptive parents brought her to a private agency for a speech-language evaluation. This evaluation took place in the beginning of October of Sophie's sixth grade year. At that point, Sophie had just started in her current school where she was first exposed exclusively to standard American English in her school and with peers. Nonetheless, the speech-language evaluation was done solely in standard American English, even though Sophie had not yet mastered that dialect. She did poorly in the two subtests of the self 4 that primarily assess standard American English, concepts and following directions, and recalling sentences. She scored above the mean on formulated sentences, the subtest that assesses complex sentence structures. Now, can you tell me a little bit about the October 2013 evaluation, speech and language right. evaluation? So we became worried, when they came to live with us a year before that, mm -hmm. in 2012, in uh, August of 2012, and I became worried within about a week about her language processing because it just seemed like she confused things and misunderstood things and had trouble getting words out and didn't follow conversations and then mangled them like she misremembered things. But we didn't want to do an evaluation when she was just in transition. We wanted to wait for a year before we knew her and before the school knew her and because she's very behind in reading too. So it like affects the language thing seems to affect her school progress. Like like reading textbooks is, you know, totally impossible. And so we waited a year and she was identified by, uh, we took her to a private clinic that had been recommended and she was recommend, she was labeled as um, severely language impaired. Okay, thank you. Sadly, that evaluator did not take into account Sophie's language and dialect acquisitional history, her educational history, or the instability of her home environments. Rather, the evaluator's conclusion clearly stated that Sophie has severe language impairment. As we will hear, this prior evaluation affected her family's perceptions and expectations of Sophie's skills, even though the de-evaluator did nothing to distinguish disorder, difference, or gap. The first information I need as a speech-language evaluator is the student's language and dialect acquisitional history. Of course, with younger children, the information is usually acquired during the parent interview, sometimes in the teacher interview. But in this case, we have a 13-year-old who actually demonstrates metalinguistic skills and awareness of her language acquisitional history. So I learned that from asking her the following question. So you're going to turn 14 in September, right? Yes. Yeah, good. And um, so, what I'd like to learn a little bit about is, on camera, is how much you've heard of English and Spanish. So when you were a little girl, did you have all Spanish in the home? Or was it like, ven acá, porque yo quiero darte algo. So you want, what do you want, a milkshake? Or que quieres chocolate? Or do you want to go outside? Or porque tu amigo está aquí? Is it like that, where it kind um, of... It was kind of like, half Spanish and half English. Uh -huh. like sometimes my parents will like speak English to me, most times they'll speak Spanish. Yeah. So when I was like a little kid, then like um, I would mostly speak Spanish. And then my friend learned Spanish and we were like, whenever we were like mad at someone, we'll talk in Spanish to each other because no one else knew it. Now, how, about how old would this be? Um, maybe like five or six. Um. Okay, so um, your mom, it, your mom is both parent, both grandparents are Puerto Rican, mm -hmm. and so your grandpa did he speak both English and Spanish? Yes, oh, cool. he like so. I remember we went to a store, and then like how he, like this woman didn't understand like the like person who was buying the stuff. So my grandpa translated and helped them out. Could you have translated? Do you think? Yeah. You could. Have, I, yeah. I helped a little bit, but he did. That is great. Could, yeah. And your grandfather, your mom, this would be your mom's dad, so he's from Puerto Rico as well. Yes. Cool. Do you know where in Puerto Rico? Have you ever been? Um, I've been to Puerto Rico. I'm not sure where, though. I don't know. 
I think I should have to find that. I have no idea. I can name every place in Puerto Rico. You'd be like, I don't know. All right. And then um, you, so you speak Puerto Rican Spanish. Mm -hmm. And then when you started school, did you start to learn, use less Spanish and more English, or you still kept using Spanish with your friends and at home? I lost most of my Spanish because I haven't spoken in such a long time. Yeah. So then I mostly spunk, um, speak English now. Mm -hmm. And when I started to like try to like do Spanish in fifth grade, it was really hard for me because everyone was at like the top level, and I was just like all the way down and I did not understand anything. And so yeah. here we have Spanish too, but I'm trying to like um, talk to like the, um, I'm gonna talk to the principal about maybe having it sooner because yeah. when you're little you get, you like can stick it in your brain more. And when you're, when you're starting older, it's harder. Yeah. Because you can't really stick like another language in your head when you start in seventh grade. Well, I started learning Spanish when I was 19. So I hope you're not right. <laughs> <laughs> what we learned from Sophie is that she has nice metalinguistic skills and that she seemed to have a lot of Spanish at one point, but she has very significant language loss in Spanish. What I appreciate is how articulate she is about the exposure to Spanish and her loss in Spanish, which tells me she has some metalinguistic understanding of languages and bilingualism, which is important in determining whether there is a language disability. Sophie's adoptive mom shared her understanding of Sophie's language acquisitional history, and what Sophie and her mother shared were consistent. You'll see in the written evaluation the language background and use section. I put that at the front of every single evaluation I do. I include the various languages and dialects the student is exposed to. Many people don't separate it out, so the language disability analysis section, they're all referring to, oh, there was code switching here and there was language transfer there, or she wasn't able to speak in Spanish, but we think that's because of language loss. That analysis confuses the section where the evaluator is analyzing the data to determine whether a disorder exists or it is something else, such as a language difference, lack of adequate educational instruction, or academic gaps that can be filled through intensive tutoring a response to intervention. But as I say in the evaluation on page four, she was exposed to a lot of Spanish with her biological family and likely with her foster families from birth through 10 years old. Additionally, I note that Sophie has experienced significant language loss in Spanish. I also say that based on the information gathered in clinical interactions with Sophie, she appears to be a fluent speaker of standard American English and is likely to have gone through significant language loss and more recently, also language loss in Spanish influenced English and African American English. I note that Sophie's rapid acquisition of standard American English is in the 18 months she's been at the new school and this indicates a strong facility to acquire language and to understand metalinguistics. By separating out the language and dialect acquisitional history from the disability part of the evaluation we more easily consider whether we are looking at a disorder, a difference, or a gap. We can look at the language acquisitional history and realize how quickly Sophie closed the linguistic gap between herself and her current classmates. And we note that Sophie's rapid acquisition of standard American English certainly is one indication that we may be looking at a gap rather than a disorder. But of course, this is just the beginning of our data acquisition and analysis. In the next module, we begin to learn about Sophie's academic achievement and school experiences.